have a little game to kick off the sermon this morning. Are you ready? Okay. What do the following places have in common? The stairs at Navy Pier, Logan Theater, the stacks at Regenstein Library, the Japanese Garden in Jackson Park, and the Brown Line. Okay, what do they have in common? Any guesses? They're all in Chicago. They're all in Chicago, okay. Are they falling down? Are they falling down? No. Close! I've only cried in one of these places. They are on the list. Yes, these are the places that were listed as the top places to cry in the city of Chicago. And, and as I've said, I've cried in one of them. I will let you guess which one, but it rhymes with Schmegenschmein Library. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to cry in public. You've had a bad day. The weight of the world is on your shoulders, and you have no choice but to let it out. Clearly, I've been there. Probably many of us have. Hannah has been there, too. Hannah needed to cry in public. Hannah came to the temple as a woman deeply troubled. Those are her own words for her state at this time. A woman deeply troubled. She comes to the temple in her grief and her distress and her deep desire for a child. Hannah has not had it easy. She's married to a man named Elkanah. And Elkanah has a second wife, or as it was sometimes called, a co-wife. Likely because Hannah struggles with infertility. And having children was critical in that time. Hannah's co-wife is a woman named Panina, who with Elkanah has two sons. But you see, Elkanah loves Hannah more than Panina. Elkanah is distressed by Hannah's distress, and he wants to do anything in his power to make her feel better, to comfort her. So he gives her twice the amount of food that he gives to Panina and her children. This sets up a troubled family dynamic. Hannah grieving her infertility, Elkanah upset by Hannah's grief, Panina understandably, I think, bitter and resentful that she receives less food and less affection. So she, in turn, severely provokes and agitates Hannah. Oof. In all of this dysfunction and sadness, Hannah goes to the temple and she lets it all out. She prays to God, prays for a child with tears running down her cheeks. Hannah fervently, yet silently, pours her heart out. Which is where the priest Eli comes in. Eli sees Hannah crying and he has an interesting response. 
don't know if you've ever seen someone crying in public or, or crying in church in the pews. I know I have. Eli's response isn't my typical response to the situation, and probably not yours either. Eli goes up to Hannah and says, Hey, you drunk? Stop making a scene. I wouldn't recommend that one. It's not the most compassionate or hospitable response. Thank God Hannah is a strong woman. And even in this vulnerable state, she pushes back, saying, I'm not drunk, I'm upset. I'm upset. I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. I love that verse. <laughs> I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Who among us hasn't been there at least once in a place of great anxiety and vexation? To which Eli backpedals and says, go in peace. May God grant your petition. There are a lot of things that Hannah and Eli don't know in this moment. There are things playing out on a larger stage, a cosmic divine stage, about which they have no idea. Hannah here is actually something of an oracle. Women serve as oracles and prophets throughout the Hebrew Bible during moments of significant transition for the Israelites. It was a great hymn that we kicked service off with this morning, reminding us of the role that women play in the Bible. One scholar put it as, women are harbingers of history, especially in these early books. Hannah, unbeknownst to her, is acting in this way. Hannah is indeed going to have a son. A son named Samuel. And Samuel will be the leader that takes the people of Israel out of a period where they were governed by judges. It was a period of incredible violence and tumult into a period where they are governed by a monarchy, which was, for them, a period of stability and relative peace. It's because of Hannah that there is Samuel, and because of Samuel that there is Saul, and because of Saul that there is King David, and with King David down that lineage we get... Jesus. And in this moment, Hannah and Eli don't know that this child that Hannah prays for will actually go on to minister under Eli. Hannah promises God that if she has a child, that she will bring that child back to the temple to serve. Which was no easy thing. She probably brought him back around the age of four or five. He went into ministry, and she would only see him from that point on about once a year. And that's what happens. Eli becomes Samuel's mentor in ministry. But they don't know any of that right now. They don't know that this singular moment will be part of a course of action that profoundly changes the history of the Israelites. In this moment, they're just two people, one of whom 
is crying in public. We learn something important from each of them in this interaction. From Hannah, we learn the importance of bringing our emotions to God. The anxiety and vexation and the joy and gratitude. Hannah is an example of emotional vulnerability and emotional faithfulness. She is a matriarch of our faith who says, Whatever I am experiencing, my God, I know that it connects me to you, and I know that you are with me in this. When was the last time you brought your emotions, truly brought your emotions to God? And just let it be there. I recommend it to you because we learn from Hannah that this vulnerability helps us. Not because all our prayers will be answered in the way that we want, but because Hannah leaves the temple feeling better. Before she even knows the answer to her prayer, that took some time. Before she even knew, she felt better just because she prayed. Despite that interaction with Eli, she leaves feeling unburdened. Verse 18 reads, Hannah went to her quarters and ate and drank with her husband and her countenance was sad no longer. She let it all out and she was unburdened. And she felt better. Contemporary psychology bears this out. We need to express our emotions. If we keep them bottled up inside, they're going to find other, less healthy ways out. I can say this from my personal experience as a human and as a therapist and as a pastor. They're going to find a way out, y'all. <laughs> sometimes through physical pain and tension, sometimes through unhealthy interpersonal interactions, we need to let them out in healthy ways. And it might not solve anything in the moment. It's not about finding an answer. It helps us to be emotionally psychologically, physically, and spiritually well. In doing this, Hannah is a preview to Mary, mother of Jesus. Mary also brings her feelings to God, the fear, the overwhelm, and also the great joy and gratitude. Just as Hannah has this amazing song of praise in chapter 2, so Mary has a song of praise, the Magnificat. She sings, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The Mighty One has done great things for me. And don't miss that in Hannah's song and in Mary's song in the New Testament, if you go read it later, they talk of a God with the power of great reversals. A God who lifts up the lowly and brings down those who abuse their power. The matriarchs of our faith teach us how to bring it all to God. A God who is with the vulnerable and with the grieving, with the hungry, with the poor, with the suffering. A God who is with us in our deep trouble. Now, what can we learn from Eli? From Eli, we learn something about hospitality we sort of learn what not to do. And I don't mean to hate on Eli too much. This is one moment. Maybe Eli was also having a bad day. 
But Eli, let's learn from his mistake here. He's clergy. He's clergy. (laughs) He's a religious insider. This is someone who has grown up in the faith. He's been taught to respond with compassion and caring. He knows this stuff, but in this moment, he sees Hannah and responds with judgment and skepticism and a desire to get the mess out of the temple. And we might sit here and say, oh, I'd never be Eli. But the reality is that we, too, can respond with judgment. We, too, clergy, too, can respond with a desire to avoid someone who seems complicated or messy. We, too, can fail in our task of hospitality. People come to religious spaces for all sorts of reasons. And they come in all different states. I think about just this building. People come to this building for worship and prayer of different faiths. People come for food. People come for community. People come to organize. People come to study. People come because they just need some help. People come because they want someone to talk to or because they want a warm place to be, especially as we start to enter the colder months. People come looking for shelter. People come here for all sorts of reasons, and they come in all different states, emotionally, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And like Eli and Hannah, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's playing out on the cosmic divine stage. We don't know how our lives are going to intersect and intertwine with other people going forward. We don't know. So we must be vulnerable, hospitable, and generous, knowing that in any given moment, we could be Hannah or we could be Eli. That in any given moment, we might be the one crying in public, or we might be the one with the chance to offer a comforting hand. For truly, well and truly, a singular encounter can change someone's life. A singular encounter can change our life. Or a singular encounter can change the life of an entire community. If we give it the chance. Amen.